Welcome to section 17.1, where we get to discuss the idea of biological classification. Now this starts out long, 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 long ago, essentially with Aristotle. Now we had, for a long time there, where people had their own personal schemes for how to classify life. It was around Aristotle's time, though, where we started to see all these separate plans kind of coalesce and people get behind a single way of trying to classify stuff. So Aristotle's kind of the beginning of us having a more uniform way of classifying things. Now, back then, it was very severely limited because we didn't know about, you know, very small unicellular life. We didn't know about the idea of cells. So the classification system was primarily just plants and animals. And the plants, they were primarily classified based upon their size. You had the smallest guys that were the herbs, you had kind of the medium guys that were the shrubs, and then you had the biggest guys that were the trees. And so this is a pretty simple way of grouping them. Similarly, we had where animals were classified largely by the color of their blood, which is usually red, but there are some things with blue blood like crustaceans. And those that had red blood were classified based largely upon where they lived. So you had those that were on land, That'd be like snakes, you know, us. You had things in the air, which birds, bats, things that frequently are in there. And then you had obviously fish and whales and all kinds of stuff that probably don't belong together, but they were primarily water organisms. So this is still showing us we had this primitive drive to try to group things into related to some degree, maybe not, you know, evolutionarily, but at least related in terms of something about the way that they live their lives or where they live so that it's easier for us to categorize them, for us to reference them, for us to discuss them. Now, Aristotle's system was very limited, though, we've seen, because it groups a lot of things that are just not that much alike. You know, are you going to group a flying fish as the water organism or an air organism? And that goes with flying squirrels, that goes with birds, that goes with insects. And so it gets to be weird where a lot of these things are obviously dissimilar, but they're grouped together. So Linnaeus was the first guy to come up with a really formal system that was much more complex and much better suited to group things to a, a more minute level. And so Linnaeus' system was hierarchical, where he said we're going to have these big kingdoms, which starting off was pretty much plants and animals still. Underneath kingdoms, you're going to have phyla. Now, these are going to be smaller than kingdoms, but they all belong to the same kingdom. So in the case of Animalia, the animal kingdom, all of the phyla that are below Animalia belong to Animalia. They are animals. But this is our way of differentiating so we can say that we're going to have groups that are phyla such as vertebrates. You know, that's where we belong. We can have other phyla like arthropods that include insects, crustaceans, etc. that have an exoskeleton. We can group them together as well. So they're both animals, but they're not both the same type of animals. Now, within a group like the vertebrates, we can keep going down. So we can say if we take the vertebrates and go to the class level, we can now divide those up even further. So at a class level, we can divide it up into some of the groups that would be, and I'm doing this very simplistically, like fish. You could divide it up into groups that are essentially like amphibians, on and on and on. So we can split these up into these big groups of vertebrates. And then we can take one of those groups if we wanted. So we could take, you know, fish or something, and we can divide them up into smaller orders. So you could have the cartilaginous fish that would be like sharks. You can have the bony fish that would be like your goldfish or a tuna. And then from there, we can break those up further. So maybe the family level, you've got different types of sharks. You've got different types of rays and skates that are all cartilaginous. And then you can go to the genus level and finally the species level. But this allowed us to group things very accurately because we have lots of different ways to package them. So we can show that by being in the same genus, you're more related, you're more similar than something that just shares the same order. You know, that by being in the same order, you're more related than something that shares the same phylum. And so this allows us to get all this detail that we could not get with Aristotle's broad system. These Russian nesting dolls are kind of the same idea where you open one up and inside there's something else. So the biggest part of this Russian nesting doll would be like the kingdom. And as you work your way through, you'd be going through phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, when you try to memorize this, it's good to use a mnemonic because you do need to understand the basic levels of kingdoms the most broad, species is the most specific. So you can come up with something. Some people use King Philip came over for great spaghetti. There's lots of other slightly more risque versions of things. You can make up your own. I'll just stick with the simple one for now, seeing as this is on the interwebs. Now, the other main thing Linnaeus came up with is he realized trying to name an organism and having to name it using a kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species name, that's a lot of naming. 
and we're lazy. We don't want to have to do all that. So he said the way that we're going to do this is we're just going to have a scientific name and we're going to use this binomial nomenclature. So we're just going to give it two names. That's all we have to use. And those two names are going to be the genus and the species. Because if I know the genus and the species, we're never going to up, like assign something the same genus and species name. There are no two organisms that can have both the same genus and species name if they're not the same species. So if you needed to, you could look up all the other information. You could use the genus and species to look up the family, the class, the order, the phylum, the kingdom. And then he came up with a way of doing this in print so we know it's a scientific name. So if you're typing this, you would italicize this process. If you're writing it out, you would underline it so that we know this is a species name. Additionally, we'll also always go through and capitalize the genus and leave the species lowercase. So that way it's very clear which one's the genus and which one's the species. If you continually use it over and over, you can actually abbreviate the genus so that way you don't keep wasting time. So if I say Homo sapiens and then later in my paragraph I say it again, I can just say H sapiens. So when you're looking at these, there is a proper way to represent them so that we all know that we're talking about scientific names. Now you can ask why use scientific names? Why not just name stuff like normal? But the problem here is there's way too much ambiguity about common names. So if I say something like black bear, that would look different if you go to a different country where they speak a different language. You can have some names are not representative. So if you have a catfish, I'm envisioning something quite different in terms of what an actual catfish is. So many of these are blatantly inaccurate where they just don't actually say what it's supposed to be. You can also get where region to region or even family to family, you might have special names for something. Like in the US, we've got crawdads, we've got crayfish, we've got craydad, we've got crawfish. There's different combinations of us describing that and that's in the same language in the same country. And so what they did back then is pretty much everybody who was educated learned Latin. That was one of those ways of making sure that you were like, look at me, I'm fancy and educated. And so because it was a dead language, but everybody kind of knew it, it was neutral ground. No one had to fight to say like, oh, it needs to be my language, but then you get upset because you're like, why aren't you using French or German or my language? So instead they said, we all pretty much learn Latin, let's just use Latin. And that way it's universal. And so you're gonna see scientific names typically do have meanings, but those meanings are typically in Latin. And so that way everybody wins because no one fully wins. So that's the rationale, this is now universal. When you say Ursus Americanus, everybody should know that you're talking about the American black bear as we would call it, regardless of what country you're in, regardless of what language they speak, we can all be on the same footing, we can all communicate accurately and freely. Now if you see the term taxa, just understand that taxa describes any grouping when we use taxonomy, because taxonomy is the science of classifying life. So a taxa could be a kingdom, it could be a species, it could be anything in between. It's just a group. The idea, at least nowadays, is that the individuals in this group have similarities. And the similarities we try to get to now are evolutionary ancestry that they share. And so these guys have a common ancestor. Now, the further you go down in the hierarchy, so the further we get towards species, the more recently they shared a common ancestor. So if you're in the same genus, you shared a pretty recent common ancestor. If you're in the same family as somebody else, then that means you shared a common ancestor, not too distant past, but certainly further than most things in the same genus. And this goes on and on and on until you get to kingdom. Now, if I'm looking at something that's an animal and comparing it to a, something in a different kingdom, kingdom plantae, like a plant, that doesn't mean they didn't share a common ancestor, but it means it's way, way back. And so by us looking to see how similar organisms are and how they're grouped, to see how many taxa that they share as we move our way down this hierarchy, it gives us a sense of how closely related two things are, how recently they diverged or split. 